You shared with us just, just yesterday a poem, one of your poems, and gave us a bit of the backstory, uh, something of the, of the activity of the poet, sort of the, the, the poesis and how that unfolds. I'm really interested as a practicing poet, as college professor, as uh, the CEO now of a, an arts center in Jackson Hole, how you see the arts in relation to our society, that'd be the big question, sort of, you know, how do the arts relate to and play a part in any given society, specifically the American 21st century, but also in education. And of course, because we're working in K-12 education, we call it classical, but K-12 education of a classical stripe is deeply concerned about the arts, and I'm just interested in your take on how the arts shape society, benefit society, uh, or otherwise, and how they need to be brought into K-12 education by your lights in a fitting way, in a fitting fashion. That's an enormous question. I know. I gave you the big one. It, <laughs> or the two big ones. It's uh, the right uh. question to ask, of course. Writing arts curriculum is extraordinarily challenging. Mm. Uh, some arts have figured it out better than others. For example, music and dance have very clear progressive curricular structures. That's why we have conservatories and dance academies. Sure. Art is pretty good as well. Uh, uh, I think cinema's getting pretty good. Uh, jazz is, has now become uh, something that has a very strong pedagogical structure within, again, within its own kinds of institutions. The question is, how do you relate that kind of work to um, the liberal arts tradition? How do you integrate it? Right. And that's a very complicated question uh, and a much more difficult one than when one is talking simply about educating students to play the violin in a conservatory sure. or to take dance class. And as you know, many of the strongest institutions that do this are located outside of liberal arts institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, you have Juilliard, you have Curtis, you have the School of American Ballet, you have the New York Art Students League and so right. on and so forth. But in K-12 it becomes somewhat more complicated because you want students not only to be um, taking lessons outside of school, but you, you clearly, most people would agree there's a place, a very important place for the arts in a K-12 institution. Mm -hmm. The question of where and how and why is very complex. So without, um, I certainly think they belong there and I certainly think they need clear curriculum. So it seems there are two questions here. One is the question of their role in the schools. The other is the question of their role in the larger society. So I'm starting with the smaller one. There you go. I'm going to we'll go with the schools. Time. That's right. Um, I would say that in the schools, the most important thing to do is, is to, two things. No, three things, no, just two. Is to insist, <laughs> um, first and foremost, on a detailed, appropriate, age-appropriate, progressive curriculum. We shouldn't have to say progressive curriculum, and I don't mean progressive in the educational sense. I mean progressive in that it progresses, because of course the word curriculum means progression, mm -hmm. kuro, running. And I think an arts curriculum, while it's more like a spiral than a line, because you keep returning to the same material again and again, how do you write a sonnet? You're never done learning how to do that. Um, I think that it, it should uh, be very rigorous and appropriately, and, and progress appropriately along a clear curricular model. In other words, a writing workshop shouldn't be simply, let's get together and um, see what everybody's written and sit together in the Iowa model the Iowa Writers Workshop model and, and compare our work. There should be lessons, there should be a clear and appropriate curriculum and there are very important skills to learn because you can't really teach students to be creative but you can teach them skills. Uh, that's the first thing I'd say. The second thing I'd say is to be careful not to turn, as tempting as it may be, to turn the arts into something that they're not. In other Which words, is? philosophy. Mm -hmm. Uh, or um, uh, as important or as it may be, or yeah. history, yeah. or for that matter, even virtue, which came up this morning in some of our conversations. As important as all these things are, and as closely related as they may be to the arts, when you're teaching the arts, you should teach the arts. Just as when you're teaching math, you should teach math instead of the applications of math, which is a very appropriate field 
if you choose to become an engineer, but you have to learn the math. Just so one, you have to learn the, the, uh, the actual tools of whatever art it may be, whatever the spiritual, ethical, philosophical, critical, historical import of music, if you can't actually play the piano, it's not going to be as, as, as useful. And it should be, especially in the younger grades, very closely focused on acquiring the highest possible level of skill. And I know you're doing this because I see it with your students already and the ones you presented earlier on. So those would be my two points of departure. Yep. In the society at large, I'm just going to throw out some larger concepts. Sure. If I'm not speaking at too great length. Please. Uh, the first would be um, this document, which everyone knows, which every, everybody who's going to watch this, and I may quote it this afternoon, will know these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalien unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So that's the one that's very interesting. That's an unalienable right by, with, with which we are endowed by our creator, according to that document. So uh, that means it's a foundational principle of our politics, of our society, of our social com mm -hmm. contract. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a very, very, very unusual thing to say, if you think about it. <laughs> it is. It's quite a strange thing to say. And on the one hand, it's quite clear that that was put in there because um, the, uh, many people did not have the right to pursue happiness. Uh, not only slaves, and of course America fell down on that for quite a long time, but uh, indentured servants, lower classes, all sorts of people who were disenfranchised. It's an incredibly powerful uh, statement because they were not only didn't enjoy political rights, but they were not really presumed to have the unalienable right endowed by their creator to pursue their own happiness. Mm -hmm. So the reason this is so important for this conversation is because as soon as you say you have the right to pursue your happiness, the question arises. What's the logical question? What would make you happy? What is happiness? Sure. Welcome to the humanities. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the arts. Uh, welcome to Aristotle. Right. What is a good life? If happiness is part of a good life, if that's a fundamental right, it seems to me impossible to answer that question in a responsible way without some rather serious education. Mm. Um, and if it's a fundamental and unalienable political right, it seems to me that we have a duty, if we are to do our part to help maintain a free, open, and democratic society in the spirit of that great document, to uh, make sure that we're doing our part to educate young people to be able to at least have the opportunity to pursue that happiness. This is not a frivolous thing. No. This is no, not a secondary not. thing. This is joined at the hip to right. the notion of what it means to live as a free, human being with a voice in an open and democratic right. society. And uh, I don't, that, that's the swiftest argument for the um, importance of the arts and humanities that I have ever been able to imagine in this country. Pretty quick, I'll give you that. That's, uh, that's perhaps a little faster than I could have ever imagined. That's a, that, so that would be a point like of that. departure for yep. conversation. I like that. We have a, we have, uh, a duty Right. as educators. Right. The, the humanities, we have a duty to inculcate independent thinking about philosophical issues if we are to create free men and women. Period. Yes. And yet the interesting thing <laughs> And we don't is, have to prove it, it's right there in the document. It's there, but the fact that you're relating the arts to that pursuit is striking to me because as you said moments ago, those skills, right, that in some kind of circular fashion, which I imagine like a cone, right, rising upward, yeah. right, towards you return an to them again and again. It's not and, like learning addition, right? And yet there again. is an achievement and a making, right, that the that the student is experiencing. That apparently, at least what we're seeing in our schools, brings happiness. There's a fulfillment, mm -hmm. right? There's a a deep sense of. Um, achievement with with those competencies with the acquisition of those mm -hmm. competencies right that I, I can, agree completely that I can play that I can sing that I can produce right this work of art join so, and join with others in doing and that. join with others it is a communal activity so uh, last question then as we bring this work of k-12 classical education to American families 
how do we present the arts in the most persuasive and winsome fashion as integral? You've described it as integral. I get it. I buy in. But we actually need to, to explain this yes. to our family. This was what would be the second half of my answer to the previous question. So we're right on the same page. So here we'll take the deep dive. And I, I would encourage everybody to read a brilliant essay uh, by a political philosopher, a conservative with a small c, political philosopher named Michael Oakeshott. Are you familiar with him? I am. I am. He, there's a book um, that he has called, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting the title of the book, Rationalism in Politics and Other Essays. I think it's published by the Liberty Fund. And there's a long essay in there that I think came out in the, in the late 1950s or early 1960s called The Voice of Poetry in the Conversation of Mankind. Mm. And this is one of the, I think, one of the greatest 20th century statements on aesthetics that I know of, uh, that I've ever seen. And it's rarely, if ever, read by people uh, in, in academic uh, English departments. It's not read by many people at all, partly because it was by Oakshot, and he talks about the, his ideas there elsewhere, but he's not really in that field, mm -hmm. and um, he's unpopular, I suppose, for a number of reasons, certainly not fashionable. I've read it many times now and I've taught it. It's a work of genius and uh, it provides the hinge from the statement in, that we were talking about earlier to the question of, of why. And he argues very briefly that there are three primary voices in the conversation of mankind and that constitute civilization. One is the practical voice in which he includes uh, discussions of virtue and politics, mm. uh, not just how to build a house or far, you know, uh, how to run a pharmacy. And then there's the question of the pursuit of pure truth, in which he would include philosophy and mathematics, um, the useless knowledge of how far it is to Alpha Centauri, um, or the apparently useless knowledge of that, pursued for its own sake. And then there is the voice of poetry. And the voice of poetry is the voice of delight. And he rightly makes the point that um, this is an absolutely crucial part of everyone's life. Uh, he doesn't make the argument exactly this way. But if we look around and we think about the utility of art, the question isn't what use it is, but rather, is it possible to live without it? Human beings don't seem to be able to do that. Mm. The clothes we wear, the, uh, our haircuts, or in my eat, case, the right? food we yeah, eat, the, sure. the, the design of these chairs, the design of this building, the architecture. Why are there plants here? They don't need to be plants here. They're here to give us delight because human beings take delight in living things. And so we have plants. With, there's no purpose to have them here, and yet we go to great trouble to get these gigantic planters up here on the fifth floor mm -hmm. so that we can have beauty while we're sitting here having this conversation, or delight, or joy. Um, and that, he says, is the voice of, of, uh, of poetry. And he says, he points out that we ignored it at our peril, and that without it, the other voices become, uh, that if we, if we don't have the full constellation of those voices, uh, we don't really have civilization. And it's not so much a question then of um, supporting them because they inevitably occur. Human beings cannot live without them. When, when it's a trick question when people ask, you know, what poetry is for, my response is, if poetry, by which Oakshot of course means uh, all create, creative interaction of this kind, uh, were to, if you were to try to take it out of your life, you would have no language. You would have to erase everything on your iPhone. No drama, no television, no advertisements. You'd wear a potato sack. Uh, you wouldn't have a name, you would have a number. Right. Um, and I tell, uh, my response is, if you can live that way for a week, let alone a year, and come back to me and make your case for living without delight in your life as, a, as an appropriate way to live, then I'll listen. But you're not gonna have any language to use because the language is created by the poets in any event. You won't even have a name, because your name is merely a metaphor. Um, you won't have any words to speak. You won't have any clothes to wear. You won't have any rings on your fingers. You won't have a haircut, and so on and so forth. Your teeth will be crooked. <laughs> the, the, so, so it seems quite clear that human beings are incapable of living without adorning without it. their lives. Right. It's, there, it, it is not a thing that people can do. One of the first things that children do as soon as they can use their hands is start arranging things in patterns. Mm -hmm. And you'll walk into the room and you'll go, oh, all the red ones are there and all the blue ones are there. And that's, that's a choice that has no utility. It's simply something that we do. Um, 
naturally or apparently naturally. Yeah. And, and, and in the arts, what we do is we are cultivating that inherent human quality uh, and educating it and refining it and turning it into a part of the conversation of mankind. And Oakshot points out that within this context, uh, it's not knowledge or skill that education is about. Mm. That what education is really about, in the end, is finding ways to introduce people into the different kinds of conversation that are necessary for a civilization to go forward. The practical conversation, the conversation about truth, the conversation about virtue, and then also the conversation about art, by which he means the conversation about delight. And it's important, and this is where we return to the earlier point, to be able to think about the conversation about delight in terms of the conversation about delight without turning it into something else. Right. That's right. Without on its own merits. On its own merits as part and parcel of what it means to be a human being, which I think the writers of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence deeply understood, which is why they, they said what they did there. Uh, and if you keep that in mind conceptually, it becomes perhaps a little bit easier to justify the arts in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. Final point, a metaphor to keep this in mind is that he compares, um, he compares our de the delight that we take in the arts to the delight we might take in friendship. Mm -hmm. I delight in your company simply because you're a delightful person. Mm -hmm. When I converse with you, I'm not necessarily looking for there to be an outcome right. or a decision. It's not a business decision. It's a conversation which is delightful in and of itself because of the company. Uh, we, we care about our friends not because they are useful to us, presumably, but because we enjoy them. Right. A world without art would be like a world without, without friendship, friendship, and I, mm. that is not a world I'm interested in living in. So that would be a beginning, a point of departure for that. And I'd encourage everybody to read this amazing, amazing We'll see essay. if we can find a link and uh, point people in that direction. The Voice of Poetry in the Conversation of Mankind. Michael Oakshaw. Michael Oakshaw. Well, thank you for helping us in the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> let's, let's hope we can find some of it. <laughs>